When we think of serial killers, the image that comes to mind is usually that of a monster who can't show empathy or kindness. I looked at her, I said no, I said good night. That's the image the media wants us to believe because evil sells. Fake, fake, disgusting news. The huge number of true crime podcasts and YouTube channels are proof of that. However, the serial killers on this list all had complex personalities that even a pro armchair forensic psychologist would find hard to understand, no matter how many episodes of Mindhunter they've binged. Most of the time we're quick to dehumanise these men and women, just like they do with their victims. But maybe we shouldn't be so quick to judge. Never, Jeffrey! Jeffrey, I hate you, motherfucker! This list serves as a reminder that evil can hide in plain sight, even in acts of goodness. I'm Jamie Freighter for listverse.com, and these are the 10 surprisingly good deeds done by evil serial killers. Number 10, Ed Gein was a much-loved babysitter. Ed Gein is one of America's most disturbing serial killers. In 1957, he was arrested after the disappearance of 58-year-old Bernice Warden. Investigators entering his house discovered the most unimaginable horrors. They found several chairs upholstered in human skin, a belt made of severed nipples, many organs in jars, and human skulls made into bowls. But most shocking was Warden's body, which was strung up like a deer. One of the lawmen felt something bump against his shoulder. He turned, shined his flashlight on it, and indeed, there was Bernice Warden hanging from the rafters, upside down with her head off and gutted like a deer. Gein was found guilty of murdering both her and 54-year-old Mary Hogan. He's also suspected of killing many others, including his own brother. Gein's obsession with grave robbing, decapitation and necrophilia had begun after the death of his mother, who he was very close to. He was the inspiration for Robert Bloch's 1959 novel Psycho and the film of the same name. His mother was a mad woman who would preach at him using graphic verses from the Old Testament, condemning women and saying they were tools of the oh devil. Lord, help us any woman see the sin of her days and ways. Despite his poor social skills, a young Ed found that he loved the company of children more than adults. He took loads of jobs babysitting his neighbour's kids and he was highly trusted and liked. The parents may have been less keen to leave their precious children in his hands if they had known the monster he was going to become. Number nine, Harold Shipman campaigned for depression awareness. British serial killer Dr Harold Shipman was convicted of killing 15 of his patients at a medical centre in West Yorkshire, England between 1975 and 1998. His method of choice was to inject them with a lethal dose of heroin. While his conviction count stands at 15, the real number of his victims could be as many as 250. After his arrest, interview footage was found of Shipman speaking about the benefits of care in the community concerning depression and other mental illnesses. If you've got a mental illness such as depression, to have you admitted to a hospital is adding another factor towards that depression. 18 years after this interview aired, Shipman was arrested and became known as one of the most prolific serial killers in history. In 2004, one day before his 58th birthday, he committed suicide by hanging himself in his cell at Wakefield Prison. Number eight, Dennis Rader was a Cub Scout leader. Dennis Rader was a loving father, a doting husband, and a dedicated Cub Scout leader in Wichita, Kansas. But he's also better known under a different name, BTK, a term he coined meaning bind them, torture them, kill them. Raider made a hobby of writing letters to the media, and he even complained in one, how many do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper or some national attention? He also taunted the police by sending them packages of items, including driver's licenses, belonging to his victims. His wife and daughter had no idea about his sinister crimes. His brutal murdering spree started in 1974 and ended in 1991 after he'd claimed the lives of 10 people. And then when I went back, uh, Josephine had walked back up. What did you do then? And I took her to the basement and eventually uh, hung her. He was caught because he sent a floppy disk to the police after they had led him to believe, through the media, 
that it wouldn't be traceable. On the disc, they found evidence of his name and the local Lutheran church where he was a scout leader. He'd used the floppy at the church because his home printer wasn't working. Raider's kindness to local boys led to his downfall. Number seven, Robert Bedella offered junkies a safe haven. Serial killer Robert Bedella took the lives of six innocent men. Known as the Kansas City Butcher, he murdered his victims after making them suffer weeks of torture. In 1982, Bedella began to counsel male prostitutes, drug addicts, and runaways. He'd befriend them with the offer of a safe and warm place to live while they were cleaning up their act. Bedella was adamant in later interviews that he had never touched any of the young men he helped. In fact, he steered them away from prostitution and encouraged them to live better lives. But it was Bedella who needed the most help as his crazy mind began to turn to thoughts of torture and killing. By 1984, his murder spree had begun. His first victim was 19-year-old Jerry Howell. Bedella hung him upside down in his basement with slits cut in his body to drain it of blood. In 1988, Bedella's reign of terror came to an end when investigators searched his home because of a sexual assault that had been reported. They found 334 disturbing photos showing his victims during different stages of torture. Number six, Jeffrey Dahmer took a girl to the prom. Okay, so this entry is really more about the girl doing the kindness, but it still shows us the normal bumbling teenage life of one of the most horrifying killers ever. And I remember sitting next to him in a, a first period, I believe, history class. And he had a styrofoam cup of scotch, I believe it was scotch. I remember saying, Jeff, what is that? And he threw his head back and he shook it and he said, it's my medicine. But clearly he was getting drunk at 8 o'clock in the morning. Imagine not being invited to the high school prom and then realising that even Jeffrey Dahmer got a date. In 1991, the serial killer who became known as the Milwaukee Cannibal was arrested for the rape, murder and dismemberment of 17 men and boys. Years earlier, Dahmer, who was known as a misfit during his teenage years, managed to convince Bridget Geiger to be his date at the Revere High School prom in Ohio. Geiger was 16 years old, while Dahmer was 18. She described him as polite but distant during the evening, recalling, He was scared to death of girls. He was scared to death I was going to kiss him. Here he came back, they wouldn't let him back in because he had gone to McDonald's. Because he was so nervous at dinner, he didn't eat enough. He was still hungry. He had the McDonald's bags to prove it, showing me here's the cheeseburger wrappers. I saved him so in case, you know, he didn't believe where I was. He did apologize. He felt bad. He was real upset, you know. Yeah, he said he thought, because he thought he embarrassed me. And I said, no, I was fine. You know, stuff happens. The night of the prom was the last time Geiger saw Dharma. That is, until 13 years later, when the horrors of his crimes appeared on the news, bringing his face into pretty much every home in America. Number five, Israel Keyes confessed to protect his daughter. In 2011, Israel Keyes drove a rental car from Chicago to Vermont and dug up a murder kit he'd hidden there. He then chose a couple at random and brutally murdered them. In 2012, he killed 18-year-old Samantha Koenig in Anchorage, Alaska, and tormented her family with texts claiming she was still alive. In the end, he was arrested and confessed to murdering four others in Washington State and New York. I would kind of go to a remote area that's not anywhere near where you live. You might not get exactly what you're... There's not as much to choose from, in a manner of speaking, but there's also no witnesses, really. There's nobody else around. Keyes tried to bargain with the police to protect his daughter's innocence. He said, I want an execution date. I want this whole thing wrapped up and over with as soon as possible. I'll give you every single gory detail you want because I want my kid to have a chance to grow up and not have all this hanging over her head. He said that his worst nightmare was his daughter Googling his name and having the horrors of his actions pop up. He didn't get what he wanted, so he killed himself in jail at the age of 34 while in custody for the murder of Koenig. Number four, Rosemary West bakes cakes in prison to keep the peace. One of Britain's most evil serial killers, Rosemary West, was found guilty of murdering 10 young women and children at her home in Gloucester. She acted with her husband, Fred West, although to this day she claims that he was behind all of the crimes. 
Her surviving children said that the twisted couple would terrorise them with threats that they'd end up under the patio if they were bad. In 1995, Rosemary was sentenced to life behind bars and Fred hung himself the same year while waiting to go to trial. Rosemary's had many death threats in the past, as long-term prisoners often want to be the one to take out a serial killer. So, to keep things sweet, she bakes cakes and cookies for her fellow inmates. In 2018, she won a bake-off at the County Durham Prison and claimed first prize for her efforts. So much for bread and water. Number three, Dennis Nilsson devoted himself to the care of neglected animals. British serial killer Dennis Nilsson would invite young men back to his London home to keep him company, and then he'd never let them leave. Between 1978 and 1983, Nilsson murdered 12 men. Their remains were discovered in the blocked drains at the two homes he lived in during those five years. Despite the evil nature that led him to chop up and flush human bodies down the toilet as if they were nothing, Nilsson had at least some kindness in his heart. When his 21-year-old lover, David Galician, walked out on him, he left his border collie named Bleep behind. (laughs) Nilsson's work colleagues said he was nurturing, kind and fully dedicated to the dog. They also saw him save a baby bird, which he nursed back to health, even going as far as making a nest for it. Nobody was aware of his dark side and his houses of horror. After Nilsson's arrest and imprisonment, Bleep the dog was sadly put to sleep by lethal injection as there was nowhere to send her. More tragically, Nilsson got to enjoy the rest of his life, eventually dying of natural causes in the prison hospital 35 years later at the age of 72. Number two, Edmund Kemper narrated audiobooks for the blind. Ed Kemper is one of the scariest serial killers of all time. Between 1964 and 1973, he butchered six female co-eds, his paternal grandparents, his mother, and his mother's friend. Standing six foot nine inches tall and weighing 300 pounds, he was called a natural-born killer by investigators. I stabbed her, she didn't fall dead. You're supposed to fall dead. You're supposed to go, oh, and fall dead. I've seen it in all the movies, right? Doesn't work that way. When you stab someone, they leak to death. Kemper had an extreme hatred towards women because of his bad relationship with his mother. After chopping off her head, he jammed her larynx down the garbage disposal, saying later, that seemed appropriate, as much as she'd bitched and screamed and yelled at me over so many years. He eventually handed himself over to the police. Kemper has certainly been busy with his time behind bars in a California prison. Since 1977, he spent more than 5,000 hours in a recording booth lending his voice to a bunch of audiobooks for the blind. There's not much I can say about our earliest childhood, except that it was very good. We weren't rich, we weren't poor. If we lacked some necessity, I couldn't name it. We were just ordinary, run-of-the-mill children. Some of the titles he's narrated are Star Wars, Flowers in the Attic, The Rosary Murders, and The Glass Keys. Number one, Ted Bundy saved lives on a suicide hotline. There are two sides to Ted Bundy, the cold-blooded psychopathic killer and necrophile who hunted women, and the charming, charismatic and empathetic young man. I I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I, I, uh, I led a normal life, except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let anybody know about it. It was the latter side of Bundy that his colleagues saw when he worked at Seattle's Suicide Hotline Crisis Centre. During his time as a psychology student at the University of Washington, he helped many people at Crisis Point realise they had the strength to go on. Before his execution in 1989, he finally admitted to killing at least 30 women. It's hard to understand how he could have cared enough about others to work at a suicide hotline. However, forensic psychologist Daryl Turner explained that this is exactly the kind of job a psychopath would want. To quote Turner, there's this grandiose sense of self that comes along with psychopathy. The sense that you are someone special and that you're a powerful person with a need to feel powerful and a need to feel control. I think that working at a suicide hotline satisfied that need in Bundy. Thanks for staying to the end of our video. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. Be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on all of our future releases. We're currently publishing one new video every week and hope to increase that number in the near future. 
Before we wrap up, I'd like to say thanks to Sarah Jones for her help with research, Holden Donnelly for his valuable suggestions, and you, the viewers. Welcome. Stay for the ride. It's going to be a good one.